This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Betting player props during the NFL playoffs is an absolute delight. We've got role changes that guys undergo as a result of uh, the fact that they've got nothing to lose at this point. We have got uh, everything on the line, and it makes the player prop market for FanDuel Sportsbook a lot of fun. And all the props are up, uh, unlike the way we usually see things for this time of the week. So we're going to talk to J.J. Zacharies and pick his brain on his favorite player props he likes for Wild Card Weekend at FanDuel Sportsbook. And then later on, Austin Cass will join us to get us ready for this weekend in the EPL. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Research. Joined here as I am every Friday by JJ Zacharies and check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. And JJ, we match today. If you're watching on FanDuel TV Plus or the FanDuel YouTube page, we are both wearing orange, burnt orange shirts and hats. Does that mean you are a Flacco backer this weekend? Um, probably not. But okay, good. But I will say I, I think burnt orange is one of the most underrated colors on earth i'll go with that yeah you know? i love i love that like you know that sort of that that combo so no i mean am i am i rooting for the, the problem is i really like cj stroud too like just as a as a yeah. player and like that story and everything i mean both teams i wish they weren't facing each other because i would love for them to have a shot to like make runs individually sure. yeah i i have the texans plus two and a half so i'm rooting actively against <laughs> joe flacco for this week uh i'm curious though because you've been told a lot of times you look like joe flacco does that make you root against him or for him because i think it could go either way you know it's really funny i grew up in pittsburgh and so you know now i'm not like nearly as big of a Steeler fan as i used to be like when i was you know in my late teens early 20s where i was just rabid and obnoxious but back then uh that's what that's like around peak Flacco, you yeah. know, when I'm talking like elite Flacco and such. Yeah. I despised the man back then. <laughs> and now I love him. Now I think Flacco's on because now I got, you know, like I I I can I can vibe with his dad vibes, you know, that that mm. he brings forth now. Um and like the story itself is just amazing. You get a guy who's about my age, a little bit older than me, uh just getting off his couch and just dominating the league. Uh, I, I mean I shouldn't say dominating, but at least statistically from like a raw numbers standpoint, dominating, you know, like from a fantasy total standpoint, dominating. Um, it's fun. It's a fun story. I like it. And he also boosted Amari Cooper, who I traded to you in our dynasty league last year. Oh, whatever. Could... You won the dynasty league this year, Jim. Get over not... it. The, it was for a shot Bateman. I'm so, I can be mad about that. Like, it just doesn't matter if I lucked my way into a win because a bunch of volatile wide receivers hit their like 95th percentile outcome in three consecutive weeks. Well, look, we're right now, people don't realize this, but right now on this podcast, where you people are listening to the, the last two winners of the That's number true. fire dynasty. That's league. true. So, Cooper, yeah. I don't know if he helped you last year. I don't want to say he helped you win it last year, but no. um, you know, he, he was on your, your roster at least. He could have helped me this wanted. year, but I. I got I had a really really rough opening weekend and then he went bananas the week after that and he's actually facing the exact same team that he did that against this week so we'll talk about uh that game talk about uh some props potentially for Texans versus Browns where JJ is finding value this week and some general process tweaks as well uh when we talk about the wild card round of the playoffs but first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast you can find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV plus if you like what you hear on the podcast side of things leave us a five-star rating on apple Podcasts or spotify also a thumbs up on youtube is always appreciated too our week uh wild card weekend full preview with dr ed fang is up on all of those feeds as well and of course i gave my read on the slate back on monday in the first look podcast which also in your podcast feed now jj let's start things off here by talking about things more holistically because we can sometimes in the playoffs see teams make tweaks because they don't need to conserve that you know really good running back for later on this year are there any players you would pinpoint as being potential benefactors with an expanded role in these high leverage spots this weekend yeah, I mean, you could you could make the argument for a couple of running backs. I think like a James Cook is a good example where, you know, you have these backfields that are split and there's a clear cut talent at RB1 who's in that sort of like 1A spot. You know, I should say RB1A uh, because obviously Buffalo still splits that backfield. They have more of the grinder um, and some of their, their other players there. 
Um, so like a player like James Cook, I wouldn't be surprised seeing a little bit more work in the playoffs. Um, you know, DeAndre Swift's another one. I'll get to him in a second too. But DeAndre Swift's another one where, you know, I, I think that Swift is the most talented back in that backfield still. Um, and, you know, again, like I said, I'm going to talk about him in just a second. But, um, you know, we could see hypothetically an uptick there if they're going to be smart with it and really just ride out these guys because there's nothing that we um, have to worry about, you know, with, with saving these players uh, later on. And then, you know, also the other thing to keep in mind, you know, we're talking about rushing a little bit here, a little bit anecdotal, but I feel like we've taken advantage of this over the last handful of years. Quarterbacks, yeah. quarterbacks are a lot more aggressive during the playoffs than they are during the regular season. This is an, another teaser, if you will, for in about, you know, 10 minutes, whenever we're talking about some other uh, player props and stuff, but uh, quarterbacks are definitely, and this is a little bit anecdotal, but quarterbacks, yeah. Um, you know, are, are more aggressive and you might be able to hit some more overs than normal with their rushing props. I've already benefited from uh, some late game uh, flukiness with those at a Josh Allen 60 plus last week uh, in an alt market. And he got that on that third and 13 mm -hmm. carry where he just like bulldozed like 13 dudes. And then also JJ McCarthy in the semifinals had like a, a late. 15 yeah. yard run to hit his over a huge so. it was a huge run by mccarthy too well that the, was in the semifinal the one that i had him I, he uh, was a okay. 22 and a half for the championship game yeah. and i said no shot and then he got yeah. like 22 and a half on that one run right, uh, right because right. he's weirdly athletic um yeah. but yeah i wish you'd use it more i wish you'd use man, it a bit more but yeah absolutely now you may have alluded to some of these but there are also fluid situations that are potentially in flux for this weekend beyond just the guys who may get bumps in their role because of the playoffs which other situations do you have your eye on whether or not props are posted at right right now at FanDuel Sportsbook yeah so I'll go to DeAndre Swift who I just talked about um I do think they will and should use him more than the way they've used him down the stretch but I think we have to be cognizant of how they've used him down the stretch his target share per game over his final six games was 5.4%, which is kind of absurd for a guy like Swift when that number was not, not, not only is he a good pass catcher, but that number was well over 12%, you know, across the first 10 games or so of the season. And, and that coincided with a route participation uh, that dropped about 10 percentage points in the split down to about 37% when he was only seeing this 5.4% target share. So, you know, I, I think that there is a case to be made that they're going to ride DeAndre Swift more. But you have to be cognizant of this. You also have to be cognizant of the fact that Tampa Bay is pretty good against running backs, at least versus how they are against pass catchers. Um, and they're actually pretty good uh, at limiting targets to running backs, which could just be, uh, you know, the the result of them being bad against wide receivers and tight ends. Um, but their adjusted target share allowed is actually second highest, second lowest in the league to running backs. So I'm not really touching DeAndre Swift props this week per se. But I do think this is at least a situation to monitor if they do win. And then we can see what's going on next week with him. Uh, a couple more, you know, Gabe Davis right now, his status is is up in the air. And, you know, Stefan Diggs came out and they he said that they're playing this game for Gabe. Uh, that was a quote uh, that, that he that he had talked about. So I don't think you say something like that if the guy's going to play. Uh, Did he die? Like, what? Yeah, right, right. I know, I know. It was something along those lines. We need know, to get the, a Gabe Davis statue so that people can put like stuff stuff around it, like they did the, the they right. did the Nick Saban statue. Like that's what I need next. Right, right, right. Exactly. I don't think you say something like that though if the the guy's likely to play. I mean, he might play, but it's something to at least monitor. Uh, if he doesn't go, I, I I do think Khalil Shakir is pretty uh, important in this game. Could see a lot more work because he's usually a, a, an eleven personnel type guy, slot player for them. You know, I've talked about the Steelers and their slot struggles for years, uh, you know, on this show. So not only would he be on the field in three wide sets, probably in the slot, but now you're going to see him uh, in two wide sets as well. And they might run a lot more 12 personnel uh, without Gabe Davis, which they did earlier this season. It was just that Khalil Shakir wasn't seeing the field as much. Um, and so if they run a lot more 12 personnel, that could also help Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid a little bit. Uh, so keep that in mind. If, if Davis is out, that does have sort of this domino effect. I'd say more so than other teams because we sort of know where the targets would be going if Davis is indeed out. And then the last one, another guy whose health is up in the air is A.J. Dillon. And I actually think this is pretty important because uh, A.J. Dillon missed week 15 and week 18 this year. Um, and those were both games that the Packers were playing at full strength and needed to win. Um, Aaron Jones was healthy for those games. And in those contests, he had running back rush years of 87% and 100%. When A.J. Dillon's active, that number drops to like 60, 65%. So there's a pretty big delta in the way that they use Aaron Jones on the ground. And then in both those games, he also hit at least an 11% target share. So if AJ Dillon's out, 
I think Aaron Jones, especially everything that we just talked about with teams using their running backs a little bit, Aaron Jones is probably going to be just a straight up bell cow in that game against Dallas. He's the reason that I always ask that question is because there was a couple years ago where it was, I think it was him and Jamal Williams uh, mm -hmm. back that at that time. And they gave Aaron Jones like a 90% snap rate in the postseason where he had been around 60% during right. the regular season. And like, they've done that before. They haven't done that with, with Dylan as much because Dylan's been like, I guess a somewhat contributor to that backfield, but like they've done that with him before and they did it last weekend. I think his snap rate was around like 88% or so. It was yeah. really, really high uh, for Aaron Jones. Going back to the Buffalo bills, uh, watching that game on Sunday night, I was worried about Khalil Shakir, you know, whether he'd get out there in two receiver sets, but they did put him out wide a bit in that mm -hmm. game. And like, if you think about the bills, like you could, try to keep Shakir in the slot only and keep him only for three receiver sets. But at some point, I think they're kind of starved for playmakers mm -hmm. and he's proven to be that guy. Yeah. So I had some concerns initially, but like if your option is in two receiver sets, Trent Sherfield, who did run a lot outside or Khalil Shakir, I think you're preparing Khalil Shakir to run yeah. outside. So I'd agree that he is probably going to be a benefactor of Gabe Davis this weekend. All right, let's dig in some props over at FanDuel Sportsbook. JJ, beginning with the yardage markets, where are you seeing value for this week? Yeah, this is always tough because it's arguably the greatest young quarter. It probably is the greatest young quarterback of all time and Patrick Mahomes. Um, but I'm, I'm hitting his under right mm -hmm. now in his passing yardage. It's at 252 and a half. Um, he's hit this mark in half of his games this year, but half of his games weren't in freezing temperatures and potential high winds, right? Like th this... I, I don't think we can overstate the game environment here. Um, the, the the coldness doesn't necessarily, you know, scare me off completely, but there's also some win concerns. And I think the combination of the two could, and, and then you look at the, the game total too. It's not super, super high. It's 44 and a half right now. So you look at this game and you're like, is it really going to shoot out? And then you look at what the Chiefs have done all year and they haven't really been part of these like massive shootouts. It's really the defense that's been, um, you know, taking them, uh, you know, into the playoffs and such. Miami's been at least a fringe or or a top 10 team and in, in, in EPA per drop back allowed this year. Um, I just think at the end of the day, for Mahomes to hit this mark, he's going to need chunk plays. And I don't think that this Chiefs team is capable of doing that, at least, you know, from a probability standpoint consistently, right? It can happen, of course, but uh, I'm going to go with the under there. I think this number should be closer to like 242 than, than 252. Um, so I'm going to go under with Patrick Mahomes. And the other one's a little bit funky. Because I like to get weird. Uh, but I'm going to go Trey Palmer over 24 and a half receiving yards against Philadelphia. Palmer's run 57% of his routes from the slot this year. Philadelphia has been by far the worst team against slot receivers in 2023. And in, I mean, I'm assuming into 2024 too, it's going to be the same thing because it's the same team. Uh, but they've allowed the most yards, receptions, touchdowns, second highest slot target share to uh, you know that area of the field. Um, Palmer also over his last three, has seen target shares of 17%, 15%, and 19%. So you're looking at a, a situation where I think he can hit this mark even in a neutral game script, which is possible. Um, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't be shocked even. I don't think anyone would be shocked if the Buccaneers just win this game because Philadelphia has been playing so poorly. But at the same time, if Philadelphia is like, oh, by the way, we're the Eagles and we're we're better than what we've how, how we've been playing, then you all, all of a sudden hit a negative game script for Tampa Bay, and that's more passing. And, and hypothetically more yards for those receivers. So the matchup there is just very, very good. And Palmer is seeing more work uh, in this offense. Uh, and that's what we generally see from rookie wide receivers too. Um, so I, I like Palmer in that over there. Yeah, 24 and a half the number on Trey Palmer for this weekend in that game against the Eagles on Monday night. It seems like it's, he gets some deep targets too, which can allow you to get to an over there pretty quickly. Back to the Mahomes, Mahomes one briefly. I took the under in that game when it got to 44 and a half. Um, it was 44. Most spots Vandal had a 44 and a half for a bit. It's back down to 43 and a half. That wind matters. It's at uh, 14 miles per hour right now. I do not have temperature in my model. Maybe I should, but I don't because I don't care. Frankly, I care about the yeah. wind though. And yeah. the wind tells me that's more of an under game versus an over game. So yeah, it could I, be I a big Pacheco spot personally. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think though too, like with this temperature thing, I think that if you're, cause I look at this stuff too, in terms of just like, you know, how, how much the, the larger sample really impacts these games and all this kind of stuff. 
and I, I doubt you'll get significant signal with any sort of temperature, you know, evaluation or what, what have you. But this is like, just so everyone knows, like we're talking historically low temperatures yeah. here. Like I saw one tweet where it's like, I think potentially the third coldest playoff game ever, like mm -hmm. in history. And I don't know if I don't know if you ever watch those old NFL films oh, yeah. <laughs> videos of like like some of those playoff games the ice from the bowl. 60s. Yeah. yeah, like the ice bowl and stuff. I mean, like I, I I think that there could at least be subjectively, subjectively something to the cold temperatures. Yeah, and, and this is as extreme as it gets. Uh, Pacheco's rushing plus receiving number, 86 and a half. I took that earlier on this week as well because mm -hmm. I think that they're gonna be able to run the football here and uh, with no McKinnon, Pacheco tends to have a very, very good role. Any touchdown bets you're eyeing for this weekend, JJ? Yeah, you know, it's kind of strange. David Njoku has scored an average of one touchdown per game over his last four. And you would assume, you know, this is what we generally see with books is that that number then gets inflated and you don't really want to attack it. But he's still plus 200 right now over on FanDuel as an anytime touchdown score. And his matchup's really good. Houston allows the third highest adjusted uh, target share to tight ends. And David Njoku has seen a 25% target share per game rate over his last 11. And that's been consistent also with Joe Flacco under center. So I like Njoku at that plus 200 mark. And then again, going back to what we talked about earlier, um, I like Patrick Mahomes as an anytime touchdown at plus 440 this week. I'm probably going to bet Patrick Mahomes as an anytime touchdown scorer as long as Kansas City is alive in the playoffs. It's yeah. just, I think generally, I mean, as long as you're getting this kind of juice, obviously you're not going to bet it like a, like a two to one or something. But, um, you know, if you look at Mahomes, he's been in the playoffs five times. He's beat his season long average in rushing yards and rush attempts in three of those five playoffs. But when he's beaten it, when, when he's not beaten it, it's not been by much. When he's beaten it, it's by a very, very significant margin. Um, it's a small sample size, but I do think it's interesting because of what we've talked about, like the, the narrative around that and the story that you can build around that. He's averaged about a rush attempt per game more in playoff games than in regular season games across his career. And he's averaged almost three times the number of rushing touchdowns per game. Uh, he averages about 0.12 per game in the regular season. That's 0.36 in the playoffs, which is not insignificant. And that's coming from a player who doesn't take goal line rushes uh, in his offense because of what we saw against Denver, you know, a handful of years ago with his, his like kneecap. Um, and so I like this number, uh, period. I mean, I, I, I think that you should just be betting Patrick Mahomes overs for the most part within the rushing department. Um, and the touchdowns, uh, to me, has the best juice this week. Yeah, Mahomes, uh, plus 440 right now for a touchdown. He was running last year when he had one leg. Um, like mm -hmm. in the Super Bowl, he was running a bit. And like that should tell you all you need to know as far as his aggressiveness, his mindset in these spots, especially when the offense is not as efficient as it has been in the past. They might have to tap that button a bit more. Going back to Njoku, uh, that number is shortened to plus 180. Implied odds there are 35.7%. Uh, they were 33.3% at 2 to 1. Is that still okay to you? Or is that shortened to the point where a bit more wary? I'm okay with I'm okay with that. Uh, okay. You might be able to shop it too, just to be clear. You should always um, shop everything. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I, but I think I, I, yes, I, I would still, I would still bet that. I'd be okay with that. All right. So David and Joku plus one eighty for a touchdown. As always, shop around for the best number there. Mahomes plus four forty for a touchdown <laughs> as well. That is JJ Zacharyson. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. And JJ, enjoy the wild card round. We'll talk to you once again next week for the divisional round. Thanks, Jim. All righty. Big thank you once again to JJ. As always, find his stuff on Twitter at late round QB. Coming up next, we're going to talk some APL with Austin Cass getting his read on his favorite bets across match week 21 and also talk some futures with Austin as well. But first, when it comes to the NFL playoffs, you've got to win one game at a time. But when you bet the NFL playoffs, one game can win a lot, can mean a lot of wins. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, has all your favorite bets like the money line and the spread and all sorts of props like quarterback passing yards or who will score the first touchdown. Plus, every day there's an NFL playoff game. FanDuel is give giving all customers a no-sweat same-game parlay. That means if you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payday, you'll get bonus bets back if your SGP does not win. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports book partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. Minimum three-leg parlay required. Refund issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. 
Max refund five dollars unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred Gambler or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, Virginia, and Vermont. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 533-42 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia or 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Let's talk now about the EPL. We got to bring Austin Cass back on the show. And it's been a while, Austin, because we had uh, the holiday layoff. So, Austin, welcome back in. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jim. How are you? I- I'm good. I'm upset that you did not get the memo about the burnt orange shirts for today. You're going with a very classy sweater. So, I appreciate that, at least from a fashion perspective. But JJ and I both went burnt orange, and you kind of you didn't you didn't get the memo. So, next time. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got some new Christmas gear from in law. So, I'm just trying to. Get that on. Yeah. I love it. Um, <laughs> you're a smart man. I, I love that. Those are my favorite gifts are like the comfy sweaters. Uh, big fan of those as always. So I'll allow it just for this one time. Now let's dig in and talk about uh, the first half VPL match week 21. because That is also match week 21 next week. But let's begin things by talking futures because we haven't gotten a chat about those in a while. So I did want to do a quick check in here as we come out of the holiday break. It seems like there's a pretty fun race going on right now for the four spot in the EPL table. Aston Villa is minus 170. Tottenham is minus 105. Of course, with Man City, Liverpool and Arsenal all ahead of them. Newcastle laid to one after that. When you look at this market, Austin, which seems pretty undecided right now any value in either of the shorter teams or one of the long shots here so as you said it's pretty much a two-team race for that fourth spot between uh, Aston Villa and Tottenham Um, it's hard to see anyone else really getting back into it unless Villa and Tottenham both struggle which is a possibility but there's a reason nobody else is shorter than plus 800 Uh, between Villa and Tottenham both teams have flaws and you can make a case for either squad to finish in the top four Tottenham have been a uh, real treat to watch this season under man- their manager, Ange Postacoglu. Uh, they're not in a European competition either, which gives them the advantage of not having many midweek matches. Aston Villa is in the Europa Conference League, and they probably will make a deep run in that, which could end up hurting them here in the top four uh, race. But with that said, uh, I'm still back in Villa. Uh, Unai Emery's side, they're currently second in the league table, three points clear of Tottenham. But once you pop the hood and look at expected goal met- metrics, Villa have certainly been the better side. Their XG differentials plus 10.3 per FB refs expected goal model. Uh, Tottenham's is only uh, plus 0.4, which is just 10th in the league. Of course, that's uh, factored into the market. It's probably the main reason why Villa are minus 170, despite being only three points ahead. But I think that price is more than fair. Between the two, uh, Villa's the side I, I want them back. So Villa right now has the edge, and they've had the better underlying numbers, it sounds like there. The implied odds are minus 170, 63%, but as always, value is value. So if you think the odds of them claiming one of the top four spots are better than 63%, does make a lot of sense to turn that direction. We do have four matches coming up this weekend. There's one Friday, but uh, kind of a quick turnaround for that one. So let's talk about the four matches across this weekend, Austin. Where are you seeing value when you're looking at the more traditional markets for this weekend? So I really like Chelsea and their money line. It's minus 170 against Fulham. Uh, minus 170 isn't super fun, but it's this is a little bit lower than I think it should be. Um, I, I tried really hard to talk myself into a few other markets to try to get exposure to Chelsea in another way, and I just couldn't really get into it. Um, so I'm just going to keep it simple and take the money line. By expected goals, uh, Chelsea have been the most unlucky team in the league this year. Their expected goal difference is uh, plus 10.6, which is actually the fourth best mark in the league, yet they're 10th in the table. So they're basically the opposite of Tottenham. Uh, Some of it can be blamed on poor finishing, um, but there's definitely some bad luck at play as well. I think they're being slept on a little bit at this minus 170 number. Um, They're at home against the Fulham side, whose XG differential ranks fourth worst in the league. In addition to that, Chelsea also have a rest advantage. Uh, both of these teams played a midweek match in the Carabao Cup semifinals. Uh, uh, Fulham's was on Wednesday, 
and Chelsea's was on Tuesday. So Fulham are going to have two road games in four days here, especially with this Saturday being an early kickoff. And that's a really tough ask for Fulham, especially a smaller club like them who doesn't have a squad depth that someone like Chelsea does. Um, so all in all, I think Chelsea are the better side. They're at home. They have the rest advantage. They've been really difficult to feel good about backing all season long, but the underlying data says we should feel pretty good about it. I want to go back to one thing you mentioned there. You were talking about how you could potentially blame their bad XG number or good XG numbers relative to their record on an inability to finish. How much of determining for you whether that's a spot that's due for regression versus a legitimate like flaw in their team is like knowing the players like do you think that you have a good enough grasp of their strikers and stuff like that to say okay this is kind of fluky it will regress do you think that they've got the kind of team that can overcome um maybe not being great in that department yeah i do um i think nicholas jackson their striker uh, he's in his first year there is a pretty good player um sample size obviously matters the longer this stretches on the more it seems like maybe it's sure. not this bad luck sure um they're also getting Christopher and Kunku back. Uh, he's a really, really good player who's got a proven track record in the Bundesliga of producing goals, and that's going to be a huge addition for them, and he can really fill a need. But in general, if a team's just creating this many chances, yeah. just odds are they're going to start cashing in on those chances at some point. Right. So I think we, we kind of ran into this a little bit last year with Newcastle, and – uh, yeah, but it's a fair question because it's starting to get to that point in the year where we're halfway through the season and it feels like maybe this is just who Chelsea are and sure, they sure. need a new striker, but um, I'm still buying into them just because of how many good chances they're creating. Right. They can underperform XG while still being better than what they've done so far. And I think that's kind of the key thing is like, even if they're not perfect there, you know, they can get better and they're they're getting better talent too, it sounds like. So I think the, both those things beneficial. Chelsea money line right now, minus 170 again, implied odds that are 63%. Any other more traditional bets you're eyeing for this week, Austin? Yeah, so if if you didn't feel good about back in Chelsea, and I have Manchester United for you, probably the other most disappointing team in the league. Um, I like them to go over one and a half goals in their match against Tottenham. Wow, I'm, yeah, you know exactly where to find these markets now. It was it was a lucky guess, believe me. <laughs> yeah, you just got to scroll down a little bit to find home team them. goals, right? Yep. Oh, baby, yeah, we're I cooking now. Listed. We're cooking. <laughs> I wish they just listed the team name instead of home team, but right. Uh, so yeah, I think that we're going to get a lot of goals in this game. It's minus two thirty three to go over two and a half goals, and I'm particularly interested in the United side. Um, this is really mostly a bet against Tottenham's defense as much as it is me believing in United. As I said earlier, Tottenham have been really fun to watch. They're very open, attack-minded all the time. But it's also resulted in them conceding a ton of chances. Through 20 league matches, they've allowed 34.7 expected goals, which is the fourth most in the league. They've played four away matches versus teams currently in the top 11 of the table. They've allowed 11 goals and 9.7 XG across those fixtures, including at least two goals in every match. Um, as I said, United, are it's really tough to stomach back in them. It's hard to feel good about it, but we aren't leaning on their shoddy defense, and we don't even need them to win. We just need them to score two goals. They racked up 2.1 XG in uh, the match at Tottenham earlier this year, although they didn't convert their chances into a goal. But I think they're going to find a lot of joy and create plenty of chances in this home match against Tottenham. And it should be a really fun match to watch as a neutral. So, yeah, I like their chances and uh, at this minus 158 number. Yeah, that is for them to go over one and a half goals in this game against Tottenham. You get to both uh, fade the Tottenham defense and you don't have to worry about the Man United defense on their end. So uh, two two things that are uh, pretty helpful there as far as uh, the rooting interest in this game. What about player props? Where are you seeing value there across this first half of match week 21, Austin? So I'm going to go back to the Chelsea match. Um, it's a player we've gone to a couple times. Uh, the last time I was on here is we backed Cole Palmer to score or assist, and he came mm -hmm. to He actually scored and assisted, which is pretty sweet. Um, we're going to go back to him again. Uh, as we already talked about, I like Chelsea a lot on Saturday versus Fulham. They're minus 175 to go over one and a half goals, so odds makers like him too. Uh, Palmer, he really just checks so many boxes for this market. For one, he's been really good this season. He's got eight goals and four assists in 12 starts. 
He's also been their first choice penalty taker and he handles some corner duties too. So that gives him a handful of ways to notch a goal or assist. Uh, in a match where Chelsea's probably going to create a lot of chances, I'm jumping at Palmer to score at plus 120. This is actually my favorite bet of the weekend. Um, unfortunately, as we've talked about before, um, I would like to wait and see that he's in the starting lineup. This match is at 7.30 on Saturday morning Eastern time. So that will be the lineup will be out at 6.30 Eastern time. I think it's pretty likely that he starts, so you can roll the dice on him if you want. But... I've got two young kids. I'm going to be up. So <laughs> you'll be up with like three hours before a line is even out. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So that's, that's the big negative with this. But like I said, I think he's probably going to start. So I think it's, it would, I would be willing to roll the dice on it if there's just no way you can be up at 6 30. Yeah. The number is plus 120 for Cole Palmer to score assist. Going back to the Chelsea money line you discussed, you mentioned Nkunku as being a guy who would like, potentially be a catalyst for the regression on their uh, the, the the gap between their production and XG. And Kunku is minus 150 to score or assist in this game. So I think that kind of also backs up your previous point. But Palmer's the guy Austin was eyeing to score or assist in that game. All righty. That is Austin Cass. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. Find his work at FanDuel Research, where he is an editor for us there. Austin, appreciate you as always. Good luck this weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week for the other half of Match Week 21. Sounds good. Thank you very much. All righty. Big thank you once again to Austin. Find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. You can also find JJ Zacharyson on Twitter at Late Round QB. That is all that we have here for today and this entire week on Covering the Spread. We're back with you once again Monday to break down the Eagles versus Bucks matchup with Ryan Williams. To get that as it is posted, make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV+. Plus. Go back there to find as well our full preview wildcard weekend with Dr. Red Fang. If you got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonis. You can find me on threads at Jim.Sonis and you can find FanDuel Research on Twitter at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Enjoy the football this weekend. We'll talk to you once again Monday to get you set for the final game of the wildcard round. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 